in heaven in your glory. Lord, some days you know, we come to, and I, I just kind of gloss over things, but Lord, help me and help us to open up our hearts today anew and afresh to your word on this day of, of your rising. God, help us to see Easter as something to be celebrated, not just glossed over as a day we get off from, from work or things. But Lord, help us to see Easter in a way that we make our, our eyes see it something new today, in a way we've never seen before. These things we pray. Amen. Resurrection Sunday here at New Song Community Church. It's so good to see everyone here today, your smiling faces. My name is Ashley McGlone, and I'm one of the pastors here at New Song. So thank you for making New Song a place where you want to spend Easter with us. Uh, our ushers are going to be passing out some cards for everyone here so that you can use to follow along with the message today. And for those of you who are listening online, you can download a PDF of this card at our sermon that's posted today. Well, since the dawn of time, people have looked at the heavens and assigned meaning to what they observe. In modern society, this has been met with a lot of skepticism. But did you know that God intended to speak to us through the heavens? And the Bible says so on the opening pages and then over and over from cover to cover. Well, after today, you'll never see the moon in the same light, and you'll never see Easter in the same light either. I spent the last two and a half years studying the heavens and being amazed at God's glory. And I've discovered a profound connection with Easter. These conclusions I have arrived at on my own as I studied the heavens, and I can see how God speaks to us through His creation. And the more I study, the more I understand, and the more I am in awe of what God has done in every little detail of His creation that He intends to communicate to us. And today, that's what I'm going to share with you. So I'm asking you to hang with me today. I promise this is going to come around to Easter after our, my, uh, my opening here, but, but I need to know, am I off base? Am I crazy? So please pay careful attention as we go along today and let me know what you think. So today we're going to talk about nightlight, the eternal witness of Christ. So God speaks to us through the Holy Spirit. As believers, Jesus told us that the Holy Spirit would lead us into all truth. Then believers moved by that same Holy Spirit wrote the scriptures that we hold in our hands today or browse on our phones today. And the Bible speaks to us. Uh, God speaks to us through his community, through one another, because the Holy Spirit lives inside of us, and he works through the lives of others around us to speak to us and guide us. And he also speaks to us through his creation. Psalm 19, like so many other passages in Scripture, tells us about this. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech. And night to night reveals knowledge. In Genesis 1, when God created the heavens and the earth, it tells us this specifically about the sun and the moon. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light to the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So here we see that from the beginning of, at creation, God created the sun and moon to help us number our days, days, years, for seasons, but also for signs. So 
This is a picture of the full moon. I took this picture back in October, uh, October 1st of 2020 uh, with my telescope in my backyard. And I could just stare at this picture for hours and look at every little detail. It's just fascinating to me. Um, but what we're going to find out here is that this is the premise of, of where we're going today at Easter. So God gave us the sun and moon for signs and for seasons and days and years. So what greater events are there in human history than the birth, death, and resurrection of Christ? And if these are the greatest events in human history, then what is the sign in the heavens that points us to God related to these events? So that's what we're going to look at today. So unlike messages where you have to wait to the end for the big finish, I'll give you the points right up front. So you're, I'm not, not going to keep you guessing all day. So I'm going to give you six ways that the moon is a sign of Christ, and then we're going to unpack these. And I promise this is going to be aimed squarely down the middle of Easter. Number one, the Passover that the Jews celebrated and the passion of Christ, the passion is what we describe as his, his suffering, his death, his burial, his resurrection. The Passover and the passion both occurred under the full moon. Christ is the light in our darkness. Christ reflects the glory of the Father. Christ never turns his back on us. Christ's back took our beating and every month we have a sign of the burial and the resurrection of Christ in the phases of the moon. Now, these are listed on the back of that card that the ushers gave you. So you can follow along. The scripture references are there. So I also want to be careful about what I'm not saying today. All right. So I'm not saying that the moon is God. All right. That's not it. The moon is not God. And we do not worship the sun, moon, or stars. All right, like many other people, it clearly says in the second commandment that you will have no other gods before me and make no graven images. You know, you're not supposed to worship anything in the heavens or in the earth. But these are signs that point us to Christ the Son and God the Father. And that's what we're going to unpack today. So first off, let's look at calendars, get a little science lesson here. So there are solar calendars and lunar calendars. Now, the Genesis passage we just read said that the sun and moon were for days and years and signs and seasons. So how do we count days? Well, that's, you know, sun up to sun up, right? For us, for the Jews, it was sundown to sundown, and that's one day, right? One revolution of the earth, right? Years is one lap around the sun, all right? So one full turn around the sun, 365-ish days, and then the seasons, how do we get that from the sun? Well, at the one quarter marks, as we rotate in our orbit around the sun, at the one quarter marks are the seasons. So summer, in June, we have the longest day and the shortest night. Opposite of that, in that, is winter, where we have the longest nights and the shortest days. And then on either side, in the middle of that orbit, we have the spring and fall equinox. Now, equinox is a fancy word that means equal night, right? The daylight and the nightlight are equal in their share of the daytime. So that's what equinox means. So the seasons are also marked by these, the earth and its orbit around the sun. Now the moon, on the other hand, is a little different. So the word month, you can see I inserted an extra O there, the word month, it comes from the moon. And the moon has about 29, that little squiggly means about 29 and a half days. Solar days, right? You have the revolving turning of the earth. So about 29 and a half days in a month. And so you can already begin to see where the calendar that we follow gets kind of convoluted. There's not exactly the same number of days in every month. And also the moon has quarters in its orbit around the earth, and we call those the quarters, and they're about a week. And then, of course, judging by the sun, seven days equals exactly one week. So from here uh, ensues all kinds of interesting ways that people in ancient times tracked time, looking at do we count it by the sun and by the days, or do we count it by the moon and the months? And because they're off just a little bit, it makes things interesting. So this 
here is a calendar of this month, the month of April, which just so happens to line up very cleverly with April 1st being a new moon. Now, a new moon is when it's dark and we can't see the moon in the sky. Opposite of that would be like last night. Did anybody see the full moon last night? You have to stay up till after nine this time of year, but there's full moon out there glowing on the horizon as I was going to bed. And between that uh, new moon and full moon, you have the quarters. So you have the first quarter, the full moon, the third quarter, and then back to new moon. So that's the moon phases as they go. But notice that the full moon is somewhere, give or take, around the 14th day of the month, 14, 15, 16, somewhere like that, all right? That's going to be the full moon in that monthly cycle. So why am I going to this amount of detail? Well, oh, by the way, one month from now, we have the distinct pleasure of a full lunar eclipse. So if you like to get out and look at the heavens, uh, Sunday night, May 15th, going into Monday morning the 16th at 12, 20, 12 11 a.m. will be a full lunar eclipse. Now these happen about twice a year, but it just so happens that we're on the part of the globe that can actually see it this time, which makes it special. So you, you don't want to just say, oh, I'll catch the next one, because it might be a while. So if you want to see the full moon lunar eclipse, it's coming up May 15th. All right. So let's get towards Easter a little bit. We're going to talk about the Jewish people first. Who were they and what was their defining? So the Jewish people uh, came from the, the line of Abraham in the Old Testament. But where did Abraham come from? Well, God created the heavens and the earth. He put Adam and Eve on the earth. He wanted relationship with mankind. In order to have a relationship, he gave them a choice whether or not they would choose to follow him or not. And over time, mankind began to follow other things, to follow the creation rather than the creator. So humanity is turning its back on God. God chooses one man, Abraham, and says, Hey, Abraham, I want to have a special relationship with you and your family for all the generations to come, and you'll be my people, and I will be your God. So that's where the Jewish people came from. Now, their most defining moment was Abraham had a son named Isaac. Isaac had a son named Jacob. There was a famine. They ended up in Egypt, and God took care of them, provided for them. But 400 years later, they were slaves. Things had turned bad for them. So here is God's people. They're slaves in Egypt, and God raises up a famous man named Moses who uh, began to talk to the Pharaoh. He came out of Pharaoh's house, actually, as a child. And he began to talk to Pharaoh and say, hey, look, these are not your people, and, and we need to go back to our homeland. And he says, like, no way. Well, after several days of these tremendous plagues, the last plague was the killing of the firstborn child, the firstborn of the cattle, the killing of the firstborn of everything. So that was uh, where we get to Passover, that the... Hebrews, the Jews, the people of Israel celebrate this time of year every year, and it coincides with Easter. So their defining moment was this night when God told Moses to tell the people to sacrifice the lamb, put the over the house, and then the angel of death would not kill anyone in their home that night. It sounds pretty gruesome, and it was. And at that, then the next morning, they left Egypt. This was a very special meal of Passover. They're supposed to eat holding their staff with their shoes on like they're ready to go out of town. And that's what they did. That was their defining moment. So the Jews practiced a lunar calendar. In the Bible, we have the names of four of these months, and extra biblical Jewish literature will tell us what the other 12 months are. But the first month was Nisan, and the 12th month was Adar. Now, if you think about lunar months, 29 and a half days times 12 months is not quite 365 days in the year. So how do we make up that extra little bit? They had a leap month. Every two or three years, they would throw in an extra month at the beginning of the year, and that's how they would catch up to the solar calendar. So, uh, you know, February 29th, every four years, that's pretty easy to figure out, but a whole extra month every two or three years, that's a little different, right? And how did they know when they were going to count their time as the people of Israel? God told them. So we're going to read here in Exodus 12. So the children of Israel are there. 
they're slaves. God's speaking to Moses and Aaron, and this is what he says. Uh, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It will be the first month for the, of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. Your lamb will be a, shall be without blemish, a male, a year old, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the month when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. So this was a sacrifice to cover the people, cover their sins, and to protect them from the death that would ensue against the Egyptians that night as God brought judgment on the Egyptians. But notice that it was in the first month on the 14th day. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel, the, the top of the door of the houses in which they eat it, and they shall eat the flesh that night. It is the Lord's Passover, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This is the first part of this defining moment of Israel, when God would pass over them. And so every year then, they're to celebrate this. He says, this day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations as a statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast. Therefore, you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a statute forever. In the first month, from the 14th day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening. For seven days, no leaven is to be found in your houses. Well, what happened here is that uh, there was no leaven. Leaven uh, represented sin and pride. And so they would clean their homes of uh, leaven. They would even take, uh, tradition says they'd take a feather and a little envelope and go around just dusting every little possible bit of leaven out of their homes even um, giving away leavened dog food to their neighbors, just so there was no leaven in their house, all right? And they would do that for seven days. So uh, when, we, when we understand the events of the Testament then, at the time of Jesus, there was Passover, and then immediately following was seven days of this festival of unleavened bread, matzah, they would call it. And the matzah is very symbolic as well. Ask me about it later. So then after that 14th night, they set out from Ramses, Egypt, in the first month on the 15th day of the first month. On the day after the Passover, the people of Israel went out triumphantly in the sight of all the Egyptians. And this was the defining moment for the people of Israel. Throughout Scripture, over and over, we have this Passover refrain. He said this was to be a memorial for the people every year. In the first month on the 14th day, the first month on the 14th day, the first month, on the 14th day, and the first month on the 14th day, and the first month on the 14th day, and the first month on the 14th day, for over a thousand years before Jesus. They were observing this pattern of a lamb that they would sacrifice on the first month on the 14th day. And we see this all through Scripture. And even throughout Scripture, you can see this phrase, when the Lord brought our fathers up out of Egypt. It was delivering them. And so this was marked as a memorial forever, for every generation, every year. They were conditioned by this to remember what God had done for them. So how does that relate to Easter? Well, Passover has to do with this first full moon of the first month. Now, uh, you know, different holidays throughout the year usually occur on the same date. You know, December 25th is always going to be Christmas. However, why does Easter bounce around on the day that it's observed? Well, this was a hot debate in the early church. And they're trying to figure out, well, we came out of the Jewish tradition, but we're not Jews, we're Christians, and we celebrate on Sunday. So we're going to observe our Easter celebration on Sunday, which is going to be the first Sunday after the first full moon 
after the spring equinox that we just talked about. All right. So this year, because there was a full moon right before the first day of spring, we had to wait almost a whole another month and then the next Sunday, which is today. And that's why we celebrate Easter today. It kind of approximates Passover on the calendar, recognizing our Jewish roots as believers. So let's get to it. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Now, after Moses, they entered the promised land of Israel. There were many kings. And the second of those kings was the most famous, King David. And David was a man after God's own heart. He was not perfect by any stretch, but David wrote this big list of psalms for us to read that we call psalms. And in the 89th psalm, it talks about this. It says, His, David's offspring, shall endure forever. His throne as long as the sun before me, like the moon, it shall be established forever, a faithful witness in the skies. So David's offspring, Jesus Christ, would be a, uh, the promise fulfillment of this promise to David. So his throne, as long as the sun before me, like the moon, it shall be established forever, a faithful witness in the skies. So what is a witness? A witness is somebody who sees an event, and they're able to give you testimony to tell you what happened, because they were there. They saw it. So what did the moon see? Well, the same moon, the full moon that was in our sky last night, it saw the Passover in Egypt. It saw Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane at the time of Passover. It saw Jesus in the tomb with the stone rolled in front of it. And it saw us. When you go out and you look at that same moon, you realize that same moon was in the sky the night the angel passed over Egypt. That same moon was there when Jesus was praying in the garden. All of a sudden, things feel a little smaller. I feel a little closer. So... Now, on your handout, we're going to walk through these six ways that the moon is a sign of Christ that we remember here at Easter. So the passion of Christ took place during the full moon of Passover. Judas came to betray Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane while they had torches in their hands, and the full moon was breaking over the horizon, coming up to light the night of his kangaroo court, his series of these made up trials that he would go through that night. The moon was there in the sky. And John 19 tells us, So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out, and it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, Behold your king! And they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! And Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. So we see that Jesus was crucified at the time of Passover in the first month on the 14th day. In the first month on the 14th day, there was a lamb that would be sacrificed. And when John the Baptist heralded the beginning of Jesus' ministry, what did he say? Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Christ is the light in our darkness. I love the book of John. John begins very much echoing from Genesis 1 that we just read. In the beginning was the Word. Now the Word was Jesus, this idea of God with man. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. We just read where God gave us the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And here John is making the parallel that Christ came as a light into our darkness. The, the period when Christ entered was dark. Israel was under the boot of Rome, dominated and oppressed by Rome. There was corruption from the temple. 
to the shadow government that Rome had installed over top of them. Corruption was everywhere. Persecution was everywhere. The Herod king at, at Jesus' birth, when his four sons, he split up after he died, he split up his territory into four territories. One of those Herods, on the day he was inaugurated, killed 1,000 innocent people at the temple. That was the darkness that Jesus entered, people who were fearful and afraid. And it's not that different from our day today when we look around us at events going on in our world today and we think, where is God? Where is, where is the light? Jesus is the light in our darkness. Whether we think about global events or we think about our own homes and our own lives, the questions that we have that aren't answered, the dark places in our heart, the patterns that we've developed and the habits that we've developed in our lives, the abuse and brokenness that we've suffered in our families. And we think, where is God in this darkness? Christ came to be the light in our darkness. Regardless of what it is that we're experiencing right now, Christ wants to illuminate the darkness in your heart and life and to give you the answers that you have been seeking for years. The sun reflects the Father. Now we know the moon in its orbit around the earth and its position with the sun and the earth, right? So what happens is the, the light from the sun shines on the earth during the daytime. Well, it just so happens that during the nighttime, the moon is on the back side of the earth a little bit up in orbit so it can catch that light and reflect it onto the dark side of the earth. So it illuminates our darkness. So we get to see the reflection of the sun and the moon that illuminates our darkness. Well, John continues here in the first chapter. He says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who, it, who is at the Father's side. He has made Him known. Jesus the Son was with the Father in heaven he was at his side. He's saying that Jesus came from the Father's side to tell us who Father God is and what he looks like. At the Last Supper, Jesus is telling the, the disciples about the, the Father. And Philip says, Jesus, show us the Father. And Jesus says, Philip, have I been with you this long and you don't get it yet? I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you have seen the Father. Jesus reflects the glory of the Father. And uh, Jack pointed me to this verse. Love this verse. Hebrews chapter 1. He is the radiance, the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. This is the Christ who illuminates our darkness. And this is the Christ that we celebrate today as he reflects the glory of the Father. Christ never turns his back on us. How do you get that out of the moon? Well, you know, this was something I, I learned recently. Maybe I wasn't paying attention in high school science, but uh, I didn't realize that the moon, you know, you think about planets that spin in their orbit. The moon doesn't really spin like that. It does kind of turn, but it does it in such a way, the moon rotates in orbit, but it does it in such a way that it is always facing us. The moon never turns its back to us because it is gravitationally locked to always face the earth. I'll explain a little bit more about that in a second. So as Christ never turns his back on us, the moon never turns his back on us. It's always facing us. And Deuteronomy 11 says, The eyes of the Lord your God are always upon it from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, talking about the promised land, always watching. Hebrews 7, a famous passage about Jesus. He is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus is in heaven now, watching us. His eye is on us. The Old Testament says we are the apple of God's eye. That means that we're reflected in his pupils. He's watching us. And not only is he watching us, he's praying for us. Jesus told the disciples, I've prayed for all of you that when Satan tempts you and tries to sift you, that you will survive and stand strong, right? So Jesus 
never turns his back on us, and he is always praying for us. Now, this the moon looks like. We can't see the backside of the moon because the moon is always facing us. But when the space people do their space thing and they take pictures back there, we can see it. Now, the back of the moon is illuminated by the sun. We just never get to see it. And as you can see here, while the front face of the moon is, it has some craters on it, right? But the back side of the moon, it is riddled with craters, peppered with craters from meteors and asteroids that have been inbound towards the earth. And this tiny little moon blocked their trajectory to hit the earth or burn up in our atmosphere, right? So the back side of the moon is cratered and cratered, craters on top of craters in places where you can look at these impacts. Isaiah 53. How does the moon represent Christ in this way? Isaiah 53 says that when he was pierced, when, when Christ suffered for us, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. Is this a coincidence? Maybe. I don't know. Am I crazy? Let's keep going. Christ's back took our beating. Now, Judy's here today. Judy, I want to say thank you. Judy gets me some little gift at Christmas every year. And this last year, she got me a book about the planets. And I was flipping through that Christmas to New Year's week when I'm kind of kicked back in my recliner. And I'm flipping through and I'm reading about the moon. And when I saw this next thing, my jaw dropped. I said out loud, wow. Continuing this point, remembering that his back took our beating. The back of the moon is thicker than the face of the moon. So the, if you think about a circle and you put a dot right in the exact center of a circle, right? That's going to be the geometric center of the circle. But the center of gravity of the moon is actually off by about a mile, a little over a mile, which means that the, the mass of the moon is off center. That's part of the reason why it's always facing us when it's rotating around the Earth gravitationally locked. The center of the moon, its, its mass, its core is slightly off center. How did NASA figure this out? Well, they sent some satellites up there to rotate around the moon. And they're like, oh, wait, we just hit the, we hit the surface. Wait, we, we were above the surface so far over here, but now we're really tight on the other side. How is that possible? We're in orbit around this round thing. And they realized that, wait a minute, the center of gravity is off. And so when they send these probes to orbit the moon, they have to account for that. Because on, on one side, it's actually farther up from the other side. So the back side of the crust of the moon is thicker as if it were designed to receive this pummeling of meteors and asteroids. Now, I'm not I'm not pushing this too far. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that Christ had three inch thick skin on his back. Right? But what I am saying is this is just fascinating. Make of it what you will. Now, this picture is uh, a graphical representation of the thickness of the face of the moon and the back of the moon. Now, if you look at the picture on the left, where you've got these blue and green spots, that's the face of the moon that points towards us. And uh, by this little graph here, the blue, the green, those are the, the shallower places in the depth of the crust of the moon. But on the right side, you'll see that for some reason, NASA chose to use red and white for the thickest parts of the moon's crust, which conveniently kind of represents the, the back of Jesus that was bloodied for our sake. And I'm not making too much out of that, right? I just want to... Be careful not to push this analogy too far, but that you see that the back side of the moon was designed to take a beating as Jesus took our beating.
for us at Easter. Now, one more. Exodus chapter 12. Remember, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, In the land of Egypt, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. And it shall be the first month of the year for you, the fourteenth day of the month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. So that was the Passover that we read earlier, happening under the full moon. Now let's pick this up in Matthew chapter 27 when we read about the darkness here. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land. This is when Jesus is on the cross taking our punishment for us. There was, from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, mama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's actually quoting Psalm 22 here. And then Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. He died on the cross in darkness. And some people think, well, this was a, a, a solar eclipse. But it's impossible to have a solar eclipse during a full moon because the moon's on the backside. It wouldn't be on the, between us and the sun to block the sun's light. So I would personally, I'd kind of think this is just some dark storm clouds. We've all seen the darkest storm clouds in the middle of the day that blot out the sun. And certainly some thunder would be appropriate at this moment. So here is Jesus on the cross, surrounded by darkness. Other passages of Scripture say that there was an earthquake, other signs that happened at this time when Jesus passed away. Now, following that, Matthew 28. This is the day that we're celebrating today, the resurrection. Now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. So remember, the, the Romans had uh, sent guards to seal and guard the tomb that no one would steal his body because the, the Jews suspected his disciples might pull a, a fast one and steal his body, because he told them that he would rise from the dead. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified, but he's not here. Just like we sang earlier, he's not here. He has risen, as he said, Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee, and there you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And what do you know? Jesus met them and said to them, Hi, greetings. Here I am. Here's Jesus, the resurrected Christ. Howdy. Here I am. And they came up and they took hold of his feet and they worshiped him. And then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. That's the same thing the angel told them. Do not be afraid. Now, this is different. This is weird. But yes, it's me. I'm back to life. Don't be afraid. And go tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there we'll see me. So this is the, the glorious resurrection event that we celebrate on Easter Sunday. We have a reminder of this every month in the skies when we look at the, the phases of the moon. We have the darkness that surrounded the cross, the darkness of the tomb where Jesus was buried in the new moon. And then 14, 15 days later, we have this full moon the, reflecting the glory of the Father, so to speak. And so we have Jesus in all of his glory, his resurrection, his new life that he died to bring us is then reflected in that full moon every month. And then it, it wanes and waxes back and forth. And so we have this pattern, this reminder every month of the death, but the new life that Christ came to give us. So as the Jews, year after year, in the first month on the 14th day, in the first month on the 14th day, in the first month on the 14th day, as the Jews celebrated the Passover every year, sacrificing a lamb, unaware of the coming Messiah who would fulfill that 
as once and for all, our sacrifice for all people for all time, one final lamb sacrifice. That is our defining moment as Christians. That's why for 2,000 years we've sang songs about and the blood and the suffering. And sometimes we, we sing these songs about there's a fountain filled with blood, and you're thinking, wait a minute, that's gross. A fountain of blood? Are you serious? That's just wrong. A fountain of blood? And you, 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 you cringe at these references in our hymns, and you're thinking, what is this, what is this about? And I had this revelation a, a few years ago that, you know what? If I ever get comfortable with that, there's something wrong. Because I should be appalled at this image of Christ suffering on the cross and bleeding for me. I should never be accustomed. I should never be familiar with that. I should never just accept that in my mind as business as usual because it was anything but that. So the empty tomb that we sing about, the, the fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, these hymns, these songs, this is our refrain every year. And every year about this time of Passover, we celebrate our leaving of Egypt when God brought us out of the slavery of sin in our lives. So am I crazy? Does this seem kind of off base to you at all? Well, there was uh, this guy named Sir William Herschel. He lived in the late 1700s, early 1800s, and he was a church musician. He played three different instruments. He wrote dozens of symphonies and concertos. But then on the side, he had this hobby of astronomy. And he got to building telescopes. And he started building telescopes, and, and he realized that there's this type of, uh, called a Newtonian uh, reflector telescope. It's got a little mirror in the bottom of it. And he started learning how to, he was reading, studying how to make these little mirrors. And they're this concave mirror, and there's quite an art to it. And so he developed uh, some techniques and began making his own telescopes. And he had these mirrors that he would develop anywhere from 12 inches to 4 feet. Big mirrors. And the more light you can capture, the farther you can see in the heavens. And with his own homemade telescope, he was the first to discover a planet from the ancient times. In 1781, he discovered the planet Uranus with a homemade telescope. And he went on to uh, make many discoveries in astronomy. And then his, uh, his sister, also Catherine, she was a big part of it. And she helped him in so many ways, helped him polish. He discovered many comets. He cataloged over 2,500 stars. And his sister uh, took that as well. And then his son, after he died, his son, because in the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere, you see different parts of the heavens. So while we look at the sky every night and see the Big Dipper, the people in Costa Rica, the Chile, they don't see the Big Dipper in the sky. They see, they see something different. So his son got the big telescope, put it on a ship, went to South Africa, and cataloged another 2,500 stars. So this is a guy who's kind of deep in astronomy. It's a family thing. And there was a really popular poem going around at the time that was translated into all kinds of languages, a very long poem. And there's a line in that poem that says, an undevout astronomer is mad. In other words, if you look at the sky and you say, there's no way there's a God that made that. You're kind of crazy. There's no way this was all random and just happened with a big splat. Okay, There's something behind this. There's some intelligent design going on here. So this is Sir William Herschel, who was a devout astronomer, a devout believer. Now, now if you read about Kepler and Newton and these guys who were Believers trying to uncover what had God hidden for us to discover in his creation in the heavens. And you'll, you'll read some things that are kind of off base, right? But a lot of this is really spot on. And so these guys paved the way in understanding the heavens so that we could understand God's creation. Now, in a church near where he is buried, there are two stained glass windows. One stained glass window has a tribute to his astronomy achievements. The other stained glass window contains Psalm 8. 
which says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? This is timeless wonder written 3,000 years ago by somebody looking into the heavens and saying, hmm, I feel kind of small right now. What I, I'm just this little pebble on this planet, and God, you care about me? That's what David was saying when he penned these words. And when we look at the moon, maybe you've had this experience. You look up in the heavens and you think, Maybe I am insignificant. But then, wait a minute. The Bible says that God loves even me. How is that possible? This dissonance. Well, now, when you go out in the night, you could do that even tonight. It should be clear enough tonight to see the moon. And you look up at the moon. I want you to think about these things. That the Passover and Passion took place under that moon that witnessed the full moon of spring. The Christ is the light in our darkness. You know, you can go out there tonight under the full moon, and you can see your shadow on the ground. I, I came in bringing the mail the other night, and it was after dark, and the, the moon was out, and I could read the mail walking into the house by the light of the moon. There's a bright light. And what I tell you, if you look through a telescope, it'll about blind you. It's very bright. Christ is the light in our darkness. Whatever is going on in our life right now, where we're searching for answers and lost, he is there with the answers. Christ reflects the glory of the Father. Christ never turns his back on us. As a matter of fact, he's praying for us right now. Christ's back took our beating, and every month we have this monthly burial and resurrection symbol before us in the phases of the moon. So what do we do with this information? Paul, writing to the Romans, he says, For his God's invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, his divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. What does that mean, without excuse? We'll unpack that in a second. And then Moses, speaking to the children of Israel in Deuteronomy 30, says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice and holding fast to him, for he is your life and length of days. As the moon was a witness to the events of the Passover, events of Easter, the Passion, the moon is a witness the sun is a witness, heaven and earth, a witness to us today. Will we make the right choice? Will we choose life? Will we choose to surrender our lives to God? Will we enjoy the love and obedience relationship with God? Is that our choice today? And so when now I ask you, is this crazy? Is this going too far? Today we've revealed meaning that God left for us to discover in creation. And God told us to look for signs in the heavens, and he told us that we are without excuse when we see his glory in the heavens. And the opening pages of the Bible tell us that God created the heavens and the earth, and then he created humans and gave us the intellect and the heart to perceive him and to have a relationship with him like nothing else he had made in creation. And then he put clues for us throughout his creation to point us back to him. Now, in the beginning, man had relationship with God, but then we began to worship the things that he created rather than the creator himself. And we viewed ourselves complete without him. And that was wrong. That's what we call sin. When we make our own decisions and choose our own way, leaving God out of our lives, that separates us from God. Let me say that again. When we make our own decisions and choose our own way, that separates us from God, leaving God out of our lives. And God wants to have a relationship with us because that's why he made us, to know us. 
And that's why Christ came to show us the way back to God. And here we are today celebrating Easter when we remember not only the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, but his resurrection from the dead, proving that God has power over life and death. And it's in that victory that we celebrate today, and it gives us freedom over our sin and restores our relationship to God the Creator. As we read in Romans chapter 1, God says that we are without excuse. What does that mean? It means that we have observed His glory in creation, and we will live in sin until we recognize that God is the Creator and the authority. And when we tell God that we are sorry for our sins and that we will choose to live under His authority, we call that repentance. So I ask you today, do you feel near to God or far from God? Near to God or far from God? If you feel far from God, and I pray that observing Him in creation today, as we have, has brought you closer and your heart and mind to a place where you're willing to submit your life to our Creator. Now I'm going to pray. I'm going to share some announcements. And then at the close of the service, there's going to be some people down front here to pray with you if you'd like to make peace with God and to welcome His light into your darkness. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for revealing yourself to us in Scripture and creation. Thank you for sending Christ to be the light in our darkness. Thank you that he took our punishment and rose to give us new life. I pray that you would give us opportunities to share this hope with others today and this week. And for those who saw you in a new light today, I pray that they will repent and make you Lord of their lives. Lord, may we all stand in awe of who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm here to give some.